is Ellie coming to you from Australia, also known as The Future. Hello to everyone who's seen me for the first time and hello and welcome back to all of my wonderful subscribers. I've had a request for a cold case reading um, from Adventures in Reiki and uh, the question, or well, actually the, the, the message uh, which came from Patreon is, um, hello Ellie, I enjoy your readings, hello. And especially admire your tarot vocabulary. <laughs> Thank you. I didn't know I had a tarot vocabulary, but I appreciate the comment. Thank you very much. Would you please read on Professor James E. MacDonald? Uh, this story connects our two countries, which I think is Australia and the US. MacDonald was a physicist at the University of Arizona in Tucson, um, United States, who died in 1971. He had investigated a 1966 UFO sighting by hundreds of students and teachers at West Hall High School in Melbourne, Australia. I'm curious to know more about the odd circumstances of his death and whether there's more to learn from his personal papers, which are stored at the university. Many thanks. Many thanks to you. I actually uh, am aware of this um, purported UFO sighting. It took place in early 1966 in the town of Clayton or city of Clayton, which is a suburb uh, in Melbourne. It's actually not too far away from where I live, although I live in a far more rural area than that. It's become quite built up. Chances are uh, in around about 1966, Clayton and the Westall High School area was probably similar to the kind of environment that I live in right now. Um, on this day in April, I think it was, 1966, school was taking place at West Hall High School um, in the usual way. There were some students who were outdoors doing PE or sport. There were other students who were in the classroom learning a desk-based sort of subject. Um, life was per normal. There were around about 200 of the school's students and teachers outside, mostly students, at around about uh, a certain time of the day. And um, they looked up and found that there was a, a sort of a, a flying saucer shaped object. Actually, I believe there were three objects up in the sky. Um, of course, everything stopped and some people actually ran indoors to tell the teachers that were in the classroom that this is what they were seeing. So a lot of the students actually came outside and a lot of the teachers came outside to take a look. During uh, this period of time, one of the um, unidentified objects actually started to move behind the school into an open field area and appeared to be landing. And some of the students ran to that field area to actually see what was going on. Apparently there were three girls who uh, jumped the fence and went into the field, the, the fence for the school went into the field and saw the um, UFO that had landed. One of them who was from Yugoslav descent, her parents I believe were non-English speaking um, Yugoslav born um, people and she was uh, born in Australia or at least English speaking anyway. Uh, she became quite hysterical and had to be removed from the scene by her friend. She was later taken to hospital and I'm going to return to her in a moment. Um, the other two girls, one of them um, accompanied her friend um, when she started to become hysterical and one of them was left behind and said that she watched this UFO sit for a moment in the field. She could feel it radiating heat. Um, it made no sound. It didn't seem to, um, to, to show any fumes or anything were coming out of it or anything like that, but she could feel the radiation of heat from it. She then watched it about a minute later go back up into the sky. It went um, directly vertical and then stopped for a moment and then disappeared in really uh, just impossible speed. She said that she's never even to today, um, ever seen anything move that fast before in the sky. She um, watched it go. She was stunned and excited, went back to school along with all of the other students and they um, um, carried on their day in whatever way you would do if you had just seen a series of UFOs in the 1960s. Um, the news is actually that immediately following this incident, maybe even later in the day, Police arrived, military arrived, the Australian military. Um, there was a huge response from the government and government resources. And the students were all interviewed, the teachers were all interviewed. And collectively, 
all of the students uh, that ranged, you know, from 12 to 18, I guess, because that would be high school age, they were collectively told that this uh, episode never existed. It never happened. They all saw something that they've completely misconstrued and that the um, incident never took place. And they were also told never to talk of it again. One of the teachers, I've actually seen him being interviewed um, in later life. He would probably have been in his late 70s by the time I saw this interview. He was, um, he reported that he had um, a visit from the US military uh, a few days later or a few weeks later. And they sat him, well actually what they did was they implied that it was in his best interests to go to wherever they were, to their military base, to have a discussion. He felt that he really didn't have any choice and that he was being summoned and that bad things would happen to him if he didn't go. And so he did go. During that interview, he claims that he was told by a member of the US military that, um, that they believe um, that the incident never took place. And he said, but it did take place. I was there. I actually saw it happen. And they said, no, actually, it didn't take place. But what we are concerned about is that it appears that perhaps you've been drinking on the job. And if that were the case, we would have to report you to the education um, uh, department, which means you obviously would lose your ability to teach um, and lose your job. And he felt that that was um, an implied, well, probably quite not exactly an implied threat, more of an explicit threat. And that's what he stated in recent years. Um, he felt that he was compelled to keep quiet and that he was being told that he was not permitted to discuss the matter. And then the matter was never discussed. The young Yugoslav girl um, had some good friends at the school. And I saw an interview with one of them. Um, she, uh, that, that particular woman now would be somewhere in her, uh, during the interview that I saw, would have been somewhere in her late 50s. I think the interview was at least five years old, so maybe five to ten years. Maybe she's in her 60s now. She said she was quite close to this Yugoslav girl. That The, the young girl spoke English. Her parents didn't speak English. Um, she used to go, they used to go to each other's houses to play. And she knew exactly where this young girl lived because she'd been to her house on numerous occasions and played in her home and met her parents. She had become quite hysterical and was claimed to have been taken to the hospital, but she never, ever returned to school again. And so her friends were becoming quite concerned for her welfare. This woman said that um, a few days later, she went to visit her home just to check in and say hi and to make sure she was OK. And when she went to the home that she'd been to before, where she knew that this is where her friend lived, she knocked on the door and a person she'd never seen before answered the door and said she must have the wrong address because this family that she was claiming to know had never lived there. They weren't there, they didn't live there, and they had never lived there. <laughs> she said that she felt that it was surreal because she knew she'd been to this home before. It's not like she was guessing. She knew exactly which house her friend lived in, um, but she was being told that this was not true. Her friend had never lived there, um, and that they, the person, the occupant of the home, didn't even know who she was talking about and that she must be mistaken. She said she never ever saw her friend again, never heard of her again, never knew what happened to the family. All she knows is that they disappeared. So there's that. That's really interesting. That's in Australia. And that was the year of my birth. It was actually just a few months before I was born. Some months later, a physicist from Tucson, Arizona, whose name was James E. McDonald, happened to be in Australia doing a study on behalf of the university with regards to something else. He actually was um, educated. He had a Bachelor of Arts in Chemistry from the University of Omaha that he received in 1942. He had a Master's of Science in Meteorology from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uh, which he obtained in 1945. And then he completed a PhD study in physics at Iowa State University in 1951. He taught at the University of Chicago for a year. Um, he then established or helped to establish a meteorology and atmospheric program at the University of Arizona and became professor of meteorology at the uh, University of Arizona. He was actually already 
studying um, the phenomenon of unidentified flying objects from as early as 1954, when he was actually driving with um, two other meteorologists and spotted uh, in Arizona and spotted an unidentified flying object that none of these three men could identify. Um, he was his it was described at the time as being a pretty unspectacular sighting apart from the fact that they couldn't tell what the object was that they could see but it sparked an interest in him and uh, it and it led to a lifelong ambition to sort of study the phenomenon of ufo and so that was the year 1954 when he first started taking an interest by the mid 60s he started talking about um, ufos very openly and um, was actually asked to um, speak to Congress on two occasions, I believe. One one time, I think it was in the um, early 60s and then um, in, oh, in the 60s, in the mid 60s, sorry. And then I think it was again shortly uh, prior to his death in the early 1970s. Um, James McDonald was married and had six children. And um, by the time he, he was happily married to a point, but then the UFO studies, according to the research that I've done, appeared to interfere um, with his relationship. He seemed to also uh, be described as someone whose personality changed. Um, he was being slighted by a number of different scientists because of the fact that he was interested in the UFO phenomenon. He was also heckled by members of Congress, particularly in his second address to Cong Congress. He was being told that he wouldn't be taken seriously because of the fact that he believed in UFOs and things like that. Um, and um, he also had his movement sort of scrutinized. James MacDonald also managed to um, amass a few enemies. And uh, this was in regards to his strong views with regards to the importance of um, of the UFO phenomenon. He actually, there is a, a very brief interview with him that I found on uh, YouTube where he actually, I think it belongs to the ABC archives. And he uh, stated in that interview that he considers uh, the study of UFOs or the threat of the unexplained nature of UFOs to be the most important matter uh, for the world at the time that should actually be studied uh, more important than anything else because he said that without the knowledge and the understanding it poses a risk to humankind and um, and he was ridiculed for that he also um, was very critical of studies that diminished or that he was also very critical of studies that um, sort of downgraded the importance of, of UFOs or the, the significance of UFOs, particularly if there were no explanations as to why. There was one particular testimony that he gave to Congress in 1968, where he said that he stated in his opinion that UFOs are entirely real and we don't know what they are, what they are because we've laughed them out of court. Um, he believes that there was a possibility that they were extraterrestrial devices and that he believed that we were being surveilled by an advanced technology from another, potentially from another planet. He also uh, picked up on uh, particular congressional reports and stated that he didn't find them credible because they had laughed off or uh, dis discarded around of uh, around 30% of the sightings of UFOs that they had been studying, even though they hadn't attempted to explain what they were, and that he found that to be uh, infuriating and also counterproductive. And when he made uh, comments like that and spoke in language like that, it served to actually um, create rifts between him and other members of the scientific community. In 1967, the Office of Naval Research gave James McDonald a small budget in order to conduct his own UFO research to look at the incident of whether or not these UFOs may have actually been misidentified clouds. He was able to uh, peruse the files of Project Blue Book, um, which was held by the Wright Patterson Air Force Base, and ultimately he concluded that the Air Force was mishandling UFO evidence. 
During most of the 1960s, James McDonald's, or McDonald also devoted uh, much of his time to trying to persuade journalists, uh, politicians and also his scientific colleagues to take UFOs more seriously and to actually talk about them more openly with the American public as a matter of being an issue of public safety. Shortly after the... Um, 1966 Westall High School incident in um, in Victoria, Australia. James McDonald happened to be um, studying this naval this cloud formation research on behalf of the Office of Naval Research in Australia, and so he he was nearby and he spent some of his free time looking at the issue of this UFO sighting and uh, trying to investigate that more closely. This was held against him by an adversary that he had uh, um, sort of encountered over his lifetime, whose name was Philip J. Class. Now, Philip Class was a uh, aviation journalist and a skeptic when it came to UFOs. And when he discovered that James McDonald was studying UFOs because he happened to be in Australia at the time because he was studying this meteorology cloud formation study, um, he actually made a complaint against him and said that he was using his um, funding to study the UFOs, I guess, illegally or unethically or something like that. An investigation was conducted and it was demonstrated that James McDonald was actually spending very little money on anything other than the study and that he was doing it in his own time but it still helped to diminish his credibility and um, created a bit of controversy for him um, during his the later period of his life before he died and he still did die quite young he was becoming very professionally isolated and also um, his interest in UFOs um, and the manner in which he was being treated by the general community, uh, scientific community, was uh, beginning to interfere with his marriage. James McDonald had, McDonald had suffered tremendously because of his insistence that UFOs be taken seriously and be studied for the safety of mankind. Um, and also um, he'd suffered... Uh, reputationally as well as a result of his interest in UFOs and um, and then in April of 19 in March of 1971 his wife had asked him for a divorce so this is where when it gets a little bit weird I mean the whole thing's a bit weird but this is when it really gets a bit weird a month after his wife asked for divorce it's claimed that um, James McDonald attempted to commit suicide by shooting himself in the head. He was rushed to the hospital where he happened to be the next day uh, when he allegedly disappeared. And um, the injury that I'm aware of that he sustained was that he shot himself in the head and was blinded by that shot. So he was blind. He had just been shot, um, critically ill, I would say, if you shoot yourself in the head to the point where you are blinded and hospitalized. The next day, he's reported to have disappeared from the hospital and he was not seen again. But in the middle of June 1971, a family that were out walking found his um, body close to a creek um, near the um, in a, in a uh, sort of a desert area but obviously there was some water um, at the Canada del Oro wash near Tucson his uh, body was um, partly buried and later identified as as being James McDonald near the body was a 38 caliber revolver as well as a suicide note um, now, he's listed as someone who committed suicide, and that's how he died. But the most obvious questions that came to mind straight away were that he attempted to commit suicide by shooting himself in the head um, the first time, but didn't leave a note. The second time, he managed to get a 38 from the hospital, where he had only been rushed to the day before, 
even despite the fact that he was blind and it was the very next day after he'd been shot and he was in the hospital he disappeared went to a creek somewhere in a reasonably isolated area i guess if i guess if it was in a desert area but somewhere close to water i'm not even sure that doesn't even make sense but anyway and was found to have shot himself with a 38 after leaving a suicide note despite the fact that he was blind and i don't know whether they give out guns at the hospital maybe in texas they do um these days but um it just doesn't make sense does it The question from Adventures in Reiki was, let's find out about this mysterious incident of James E. MacDonald's death related to his study of UFOs and the enemies he made along the way. Did he really commit suicide? And is there more to know about his writings? and the investigations that he's done. Let's put some cards down. It's a really weird, really weird thing. James McDonald, physicist from Tucson, Arizona. There's crossover there when it comes to the 1966 Westall High School sighting of multiple UFOs. The threatening behaviour towards the students and teachers by uh, military uh, at the time. Um, US military was, was specifically named, but you know this was Australian soil, so uh, there's an assumption that, that it was also the Australian military. The fact that um, James MacDonald crossed the path of this incident as well and conducted his own studies. Facing ridicule among media, in politics, and also in the scientific community. And then this strange sort of double attempt at suicide, one of which is completely inexplicable. A blind man disappearing from hospital and grabbing his gun and writing a note. Before he shoots himself in the head by a creek in an isolated area. Why? Why would he do that? How would he even get there if he's blind? It does seem really strange. Let's find out what this is about. Okay, James E. MacDonald. So we have the signifier and the challenge card, conscious thoughts, subconscious thoughts, the past, mm -hmm. and then the pinnacle moment. Okay. So the signifier is the five of wands and it's challenged by the page of swords. The five of wands in reverse, challenged by the page of swords. The five of wands in reverse is about refusing to argue, reaching resolution and having inner demons. It's challenged by the page of swords, which is a mentally agile experimenting energy that tests its surroundings. It's also about there being a rapid message. So we've got this... Um, Yeah, we've got this um, refusing to argue and uh, reaching resolution element and the inner demons. Now, imagine that there's a sort of a, a, a cover up of some kind, not wanting to really let the truth out. There would be an agreement, a murmur 
amongst those that had the power to either release information or not. And the decision, the agreement there is to keep the peace and keep things quiet to reach that resolution and not to, for there to be no outliers. Now that keeps a matter um, under wraps, but there's an inner, inner demon that remains. So even though nobody stands out and it's all kept quiet, it's simmering there just below the surface. And I think that's what this card represents. It's also challenged. It's challenged by a, a, a mentally agile entity. And I believe that mentally agile entity may be James McDonald, who is experimental and willing to test the surroundings, willing to speak out on things, willing to test the misconceptions um, of other people and um, willing to experiment uh, in the belief of things that may have been considered just too hot to handle by the group that are willing to contain this information. The fact that there's a rapid message soon may mean that um, James McDonald was about to make a disclosure of some kind. And that is that could be something that's relevant. But there's definitely uh, a friction and interaction here between something that mustn't be said and something that's about to be said. And I think that's a good way to look at the baseline here. On the conscious level, we've got the devil in reverse. Now, this is um, an extreme form of addiction and codependency. Uh, it also is about ultimate control. It's very abusive in nature. So addiction and codependency appears when the devil is upright. When it's in reverse, it's times 100. This is really strong controlling um, behavior. And uh, I'm not sure what it relates to yet, but let's just... Let, uh, to be honest, I think I do. But let's just let's just wait and see what the cards say because I don't I want to test my idea before um, before I share it with you. All right. So the devil in reverse is a, an extreme form of control. Okay. On the conscious level, on the subconscious level, we've got the seven of swords in reverse, and the seven of swords is about reclaiming what, what's lost or taking what you believe is yours, and doing it in a sneaky stealth like way. This theft or reclamation would have taken place here when the card is in reverse and there's an element of regret or remorse associated with that action and that's in the subconscious i'm not going to pass judgment just yet let's just see what happens when we get to the bottom line we've got um, but it does look as though we have a really um, extreme act of control uh, now killing another person would fall under that category and then we've got this um attempt to reclaim something that can be regretful at the time. But it may also, because it appears in the subconscious, it may be the reason for the action. So this could have been um, an admission by James that he was about to disclose something here. And the reason why I look for clues where cards might be married together. And we've got a sword, sword suite and a sword suite. And there is an element of regret here and the regret may be the fact that um, speaking to the wrong person at the wrong time may have actually put James McDonald in danger and that's where the regret appears but let's just see what the cards say in the past we've got here the fool and when the fool is upright it's about jumping into the unknown and having faith that the universe will catch you this is all about you know I'm ready I'm ready to actually move forward. I'm not thinking about, I've got no baggage. I'm not thinking about what the consequences might be. I'm open. I'm open to a new life, a new experience, a new something. This could be uh, an expression of open-mindedness that appears for James. The fact that he was not going to close his mind in accordance to what was considered to be appropriate at the time. He was open to learning unfettered and um, unrestricted. And I think that's what appears here in the past. Um, his mind and his heart was open to receive whatever it was that came his way, even if it didn't appear uh, to be something agreeable with the general consensus. That pinnacle moment is um, the Ten of Cups. Now this throws a bit of a spanner in when it comes to the reason behind um, James's 
demise because this is about family, harmony, uh, peace, joy, and love. Now, Betsy McDonald had asked for a divorce one month prior to James's death, whether it be by suicide or whether it was a malicious act. When a gun is involved twice, because it, you know, if it happened once, I could have added accident. But when it happens twice, I think the accident part can be eliminated. It was either two attempts at suicide, one of them was successful, or it was two attempts at murder and one of them was successful. It's highly unlikely that one was an attempted suicide, the other one was a successful murder and vice versa. I think the odds are probably more in favor of it being either murder or suicide in both cases. Um, it was beginning to look that way, but here we have the family element and it does appear to be that pinnacle moment. This is a defining moment for the reading. So let's keep going. The way he sees himself, okay. The way others see him or the environment in which he sits. Hmm. Hopes and fears. Yep. And then the final answer. Right. Okay. So the way he sees himself or saw himself was the Ace of Swords. You see here this fool has their heart open to whatever will be. They make no judgment. They're going to say it as it is. Well, this appears here. He considered himself to be the truth teller. So the Ace of Swords is the ultimate when it comes to um, communication intellect. This is the mentally agile entity who yields the sort of truth. Uh, and this is all about the truth. James McDonald was on a mission for the truth. He was not... Uh, I don't believe he was crazy. In fact, I believe he was very mentally agile. I don't believe that he was um, corrupted in some way or pushed down some path because he has this openness that actually is quite virgin in nature and would mean that he's an unadulterated uh, pursuer of the truth. And he considered himself to be 100% in pursuit of that justice of truth the real facts, what, what's really happening. He wasn't one of those that uh, swept it all under the carpet for a quiet life. He was willing to test his surroundings and to actually pursue the truth. The way he was viewed by others or the environment in which he sat was the Eight of Pentacles. Now, the Eight of Pentacles is about education, career, career focus, training, um, career change, something, all about those things. I actually think that um, this is sort of a very soft definition for this position. We have here um, the focus on training education. So this could be uh, university, the environment of the university that he's in, the environment of learning that he's in. You'd want to have an inquisitive, agile mind who's open to new knowledge if you're in a learning environment. Um, I am, however, conscious of this um, sort of, it's, I think he may have been a threat to other people within his immediate uh, professional community. Now, I'll tell you the reason why. The dynamic that appears here now is we have um, an ultimate truth teller who is a very agile mind and open to learning new things, regardless of what that means. His ultimate goal was just to be seeker of the truth. He was in an environment where learning and expansion of the mind is considered to be the, the primary point of, of the environment, to be in education and training and learning a, at a university. That would imply that you should have an open mind and an open heart, that you should be seeking the truth that you should allow for your mind to be agile. But you know, um, there's an element of reclaiming something here that I'm not sure that I've quite captured. Uh, and it could be that he was reclaiming his truth and there's regret there. But I think what these cards have brought up is another possibility. And that is that those in his environment that also had careers to protect may have been threatened by 
by him in some way. And it was their attempt to reclaim something, their attempt to get away with something that led down a path of regret. This is his passing. And I think the fact that it appears as something like the devil in reverse instead of something like the star that would be really positive or or something very empath empathetic that appears with the cup suite like the Queen of Cups or something. I actually think that what this demonstrates is that it was an unwilling death, that it was not a suicide. And, that, you know, I'm really sorry, but just common sense tells me that a man who's just shot himself in the head to the point where he's blind is not going to get out of hospital the very next day all by himself, find a way to transport himself from the hospital to some creek in the middle of nowhere in an area that's designed, that's described as desert, somewhere along the way, find himself a 38 caliber gun, write a note, despite the fact that he's blind. I could even find a pen to be honest, but write a note to fight the, despite the fact that he's blind and then shoot himself again just to be sure. And this kind of supports my doubts. What else supports my doubts is the hopes and fears card. So the hanged man um, in the hopes and fears card is about being blocked. It's about being prevented uh, from, from achieving what it is you set out to do. If you, uh, it's also, um, it, slight, there are also slightly other uh, different meanings as well, but primarily it's about, you know, being unable to reach out for something that you want to get. It's just out of reach or uh, being unable to stop a moving element or being unable to, to get something that has stalled to move again. It's all about not being able to sort of achieve what it is you're trying to get activated. It means you have to let go of what you're after it makes you powerless in some way. And I think that this was a hope card to render James and his inquisitive open heart and open mind and his inquisitive mind and his desperate, um, devoted search for the truth to put it on hold, to stop it and to prevent it and make it powerless. And I think that was the hope. That was the reason for the unwilling death of James MacDonald. So I do think his death was created by someone else. Um, the final outcome is the High Priestess in Reverse. And the High Priestess in Reverse is about emerging from depression. It can also be a predatory card and it's about the revealing of secrets. I think there was a, a risk there of him revealing secrets. I think that um, I'm going to have to get clarification on the element of family here, but I think that he was pursued. So this was a predatory element. And then the emerging from depression, I think also, you know, it sits beneath a family card. I think that perhaps what may have happened was his demise, his demise was, um, a, was going to occur at some point, but I think there may have been a weak point in him that, allowed for this to take place, made him vulnerable, perhaps, because of the issue of his family. Perhaps his strength came from his family and something at the time of his wife asking for a divorce created a vulnerability in him that gave people an open door to be able to, to for something to happen to him, where they were able to pursue him because this is a predatory card and prevent him from being able to use the attributes that he had here to be able to speak of the unspeakable. And I think this was the attempt to prevent him from speaking about things that actually he felt that the world should know. I'm running really over on time, but I want to know if there is here, I'm gonna use all of the deck actually, I just want to get this loose end tied up when it comes to James McDonald's card here, which is about family harmony, peace, joy, and love that appeared in his, in his, that pivotal moment. If I can get some clarity on this.
I think it would have been clearer if the card had appeared in reverse because then it would have sort of shown that there was an element of discord in the family. Okay, Ten of Wands, the Four of Pentacles in reverse, and the Eight of Wands. Okay, stress, tough times, burden and responsibility, being afraid to leave your comfort zone and being really stingy about um, holding on to things really, really tightly. And then we've got here change, motivation and getting your ducks in a row. Um, I can see where he would desperately want to hang on to what he's got. I can see the stress that appears here. This is a change in dynamic and allowing it to, to create, um, getting ducks in a row. I think he just, I think he just lost, lost his safety net. So let's put down another card and let's just double check. We've got Ace of Cups. This is about falling out of love, losing love. That's exactly what happened. Let's try one more. Okay, yep. Yeah. All right, so it was, um, there was a pivotal moment when it came to the breakdown of his relationship that I think created a weakness in him. And the weakness may have afforded him that fateful moment where he spoke to the wrong person about how he really felt or something like that that he he dropped the ball for a moment and that made him very vulnerable um there was the stress there the desperation to hold on giving someone an opportunity that to there was that 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 falling out of love and the opportunity that it presented but you see, ultimately, it led to the ending of James MacDonald. This card is about endings, beginnings, transformation, transition, and possibly death as well. I think that it was the, the pivotal moment for him had to do with his relationship. I don't think his wife arranged for him to be killed or anything. I think the moment made him vulnerable. And that's what happened. I'm still not I'm still not sure. It does seem as though perhaps his death was not at his own hands. I want to ask that specific question. Did James McDonald kill himself? Did he commit suicide? I don't think he committed suicide. This is the same card that came up before. This is also the same card that came up before. This is about getting your ducks in a row um, and wanting there to be a change. This is a predatory card and this is an element of victimhood. I actually think he was a victim of something and that he had a moment of weakness and that it, the passing was not something. It may have been categorized as suicide at the time, but the cards would indicate that there was more to it than that. I think he'd become a nuisance, but he had was very protective of himself. But then in that final sort of uh, month of his life, his sense of uh, self-preservation must have been diminished by um, grief and stress and loss of love and things like that. And that made him really vulnerable. And then what happened was that his life was taken. I feel compelled to go on <laughs> and I'm going to do one more. I can't help myself. Okay, I've got to. So let's ask that other question. Did James McDonald lose his life because of his study of UFO phenomenon? Is that what it was?
So um, the Queen of Cups sometimes comes up as an, um, as a, a card of empathy that can mean a person's passing. Temperance is about balance, moderation and getting things right. And then justice in reverse is about a karmic kind of justice. It's about um, a poetic justice in a way. Justice and moderation and empathy. We then have loss and bereavement. I think, yes, and I think um, the message was that he was he was just a little bit too out there for the mainstream, for the moderate, balanced viewpoint. You see, I'm using the language of the, the cards. What he was lacking was that temperance, and it was just getting too much. Every time they punched him, he punched back, or every time they punched him, he got up and kept going. So there you go. Quite a, a mystery. But I do suspect that um, it's not all as it has been documented to be. The cards seem to think that there's more to it. Thank you so much for watching. I love knowing you're here and I'll see you in my dreams. Bye.